Picture a society in which education is at its finest. Pupils are well nurtured and thrive in their learning. People from all backgrounds and all genders across the globe, upper, middle and working class, have equal opportunities and a fundamental right to an opportunity enriched education. When we think of what goals we want to achieve by 2050, combating climate change or ending world hunger are high on everyone's wish lists. I believe reducing the inequality gap within education to offer equal opportunities to all young people is equally important. After all, it's education that enables individuals and communities to bring regeneration to every other aspect of our lives. I have a confession. I've had a privileged education which has opened endless doors for me. Life could have been very different for me. For example, more than 50% of young students from 58 out of 133 countries have not completed upper secondary education. 53% of 10 year olds from low and middle income backgrounds are unable to read or understand a short age appropriate text. The gaps in inequalities have grown during the COVID-19 pandemic. It might shock you to know that in the UK, a so-called developed nation, one in three students from low income backgrounds are unable to read or write or solve a basic math question by primary school. If you come from a low income background, you are three times more likely to be permanently excluded from school and 2.5 times less likely to be admitted into a selective university. This is manifestly unfair. And by looking and reading around, very little has been done to tackle this issue. Let's take a look at some of the history to see what we can learn. In 1944, the UK government introduced grammar schools to solve this problem. They were non-fee paying, but selective schools that aimed to provide a better education for intelligent children of all socio-economic backgrounds. Whilst grammar schools intended to create more opportunity for children from non-wealthy backgrounds, only 2.6% attending were from working class families. The number of grammar schools has been reduced from 1,298 in 1964 to a mere 163 in 2021. Clearly, if we've gone down to almost 10% of what we started with, cram schools was never an ideal solution for social mobility. Instead, grammar schools have become a refuge for the elite, wealthy and highly educated parents who equip their children with ready-made social networks and expensive tutors. Coming from an educated background not only favours a child in entering a grammar school, but favours them in every aspect of the educational system which involves learning for exams. The current method of examination involves learning for tests and having the time and support available at home. This is because there are so many factors that can influence how well a child succeeds at education. Your parents and their jobs, your background, your environment, your financial situation, to name a few. Since grammar schools are so heavily reliant on the type of background you're born in, it becomes increasingly harder to challenge this social mobility. 
let me suggest a few ideas to level up the inequality gap. One suggestion as a country would be to increase the investment in secondary state schools, specifically those with disadvantaged students. England have the second largest GDP in Europe, which is a measure of the size and wealth of a country's economy. Yet we rank 17th in the Social Mobility Index, which is significantly low for a developed country. England are not investing enough money into primary schools, with the current spending merely £6,500 per year per child, which is 9% lower than a decade ago. We need to bring back funding to a level that equates if not better as that of the 2010s, and go one step further by ensuring more money is invested in schools with high percentages of students from low-income backgrounds or have English as an additional language. Let's compare the UK to a near neighbour. Take Finland, a middle-ranking country a decade ago, to third in the Social Mobility Index. Finland invests an average of £9,000 per year per child, using money to ensure schools have basic resources, such as libraries and textbooks, as well as extra teaching assistance to help with struggling students. In Finland, it takes an average of two generations to approach from a low-income family to the mean income, compared with five generations in the UK. Let's take a look at another example. In Germany, the average class size is 12 students per teacher, compared with England's 21 students per teacher in primary school and 30 in a state school. The government has talked about levelling up the education system Yet we have lost £90 million this year due to underfunding, mostly affecting disadvantaged students. It is becoming increasingly harder to challenge this social mobility. A second approach would be to accelerate the rollout of T-levels, which is a new vocational qualification aimed to teach practical skills with first-hand experience. With only one in four working class children attending university, a vocational qualification would accelerate social mobility for some students. T levels are typically studied between ages 16 to 18. They will enable students to progress onto university, which will then enable social mobility. And finally, a third approach in reducing the inequality gap within education would be to introduce more classes during the summer holidays. For example, it's no coincidence that the crime rate during the summer shoots up by 35%. Let's take a look across the pond. In America, the Baltimore study followed a sample of 790 children from ages 6 to 22. The data concluded that by ninth grade, almost two thirds of the achievement gap between higher and low income students was explained by unequal access to summer learning opportunities. Moreover, why stop during the summer? Why not give added support during term time? Staggeringly, there is no research that suggests adding homework clubs will improve performance. Yet my friends and I have all been helped at various points in our lives with our homework. And it seems obvious that if a child doesn't have the support at home, it can be difficult to cope alone. 2021 is a difficult year for the education system. With the recovery from COVID, and a £90 million funding cut mostly affecting disadvantaged students, it is becoming increasingly harder to challenge this social mobility. The government 
has not made enough change through the underfunding of schools and the lack of reform. So, what do we do? Well, this is a call to all young people. We need to do more to make the government listen. Greta Thunberg was 15 when she was protesting outside the Swedish parliament to promote climate change. Thousands of pupils went on strike and followed her. Teenagers have clearly got the options these days with social media and demonstrations to get heard. Therefore, why don't we use our voices to enact change? We want to regenerate our educational system to offer equal opportunities to all young people, no matter your background, no matter your class, no matter your gender. In the same way, people mobilize themselves for climate change. They can mobilize themselves to regenerate our educational system. Schools aren't fair. Let's do something about that.